Hey. Um, so when I heard that the Pythas, uh, sorry, the Europython organizers were looking for some more advanced talks, I was thinking that maybe this is a good opportunity for me to speak a bit more about um, developing plugins and explaining how you can get started developing plugins. So that's kind of what this talk is about. Um, I hope by the end of this talk you will feel kind of that you know enough to get started. Um, I realized the Pythas documentation is tricky to navigate and doesn't explain much about how you actually implement plugins. So kind of what I'm trying with this talk is um, to help with that. So I would encourage you, if you have any questions, like during the talk, please um, let me know and I'll try to explain whatever I'm showing on screen. Um, due to the nature of showing, like uh, since I want to show a lot of code, um, I won't have any code examples on the slides itself. So I'll switch to my editor. If I'm too fast for any reason, please let me know. Um, I'll try to be um, aware of this and uh, take the time to, to, for everyone to catch up. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, will the code be available? Yeah, it's already on GitHub, and I, I created Git commits for every individual step. So sh you should be able to follow up um, along later on. Um, so. I would like to start this with maybe giving a big hand to all of the amazing organizers and volunteers. <laughs> and then maybe before we talk about myself, I would like to take a selfie with every one of you because I need some proof from my manager that we had a full house today. <laughs> Cool, thanks. <laughs> um, so who am I? Um, mostly I, I work on the cookie cutter project um, and I'm a member of the PyTest team. So if you see someone tweeting from the pytest.org handle, that's maybe Brianna, maybe it's myself. Um, I try to post um, some PyTest um, tricks every once in a while on my personal Twitter. Um, so if you're interested, you can, you can follow me. Uh, I'll have my handle on the next slide, I think. And my day job is I'm a senior test engineer at Mozilla, so I work on Firefox telemetry. Um, and more about that later. Um, you can find the um, contents for this talk also on my blog. That's rafael.code. Um, I'm Hackebrot on GitHub and Twitter. Please don't ask me where this handle comes from. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned, I work for Mozilla, um, so we are the people behind the Firefox browser. And um, I want to start this with maybe just giving a very important update on the PyTest project, because we recently um, uh, released the first version of the 5.0 um, series, and that's the first release that doesn't support Python 2 any longer. So if you're using a modern version of PIP and setup tools, you'll be just fine because they're uh, intelligent tools and they will get you the version that's compatible with your Python installation. Um, we will continue to maintain Python 2 in our uh, 4.6 series, um, so there will be maintenance um, releases going out, um, but 5.0 is only supporting 3.5 and newer. Um, if you want to find out more about this specific topic, you can take a picture of this link, maybe. Um, we have some maintenance schedule, so I think we're expecting to be releasing um, bug fix releases until next year, I think. More on this at this link. So getting to this talk. Um, plugin hacks to make you pro more productive. The reason why I chose this title is because um, a, lot of the, a lot of times, especially as a test engineer, there's also always some sort of like convincing work that I need to do with uh, teams shipping product, um, sorry, product uh, enhancements and whatnot to also work on tests. And um, so from my experience having worked in this uh, field for quite some time is that as a test engineer you can do a lot by making your test suite more intelligent. Um, so that you don't compromise, for instance, on speed. So if your tests are fast, your developers will use them as, oh, sorry, will run them as part of the development workflow, so they have an incentive actually maintaining the test as well. So um, I think PyTest is a framework where you can do a lot of things um, to help with that. 
That's the blog post um, that I mentioned before. This is kind of based on a talk that I gave at Pi Berlin. And in this talk, it was more or less an introduction to PyTest. Um, and today, I just want to kind of go over this blog post very briefly to summarize of what we're talking about, to give you some context. And please let me know if you can read that OK. Cool. So the, for the purpose of this talk, I created this uh, dummy project, example project, which is called Earth. And it, uh, it tries, I tried to be funny because I was watching this nature documentary, and they give all of these funny facts about animals that are well, not funny, interesting, in fact. Um, so I came up with this idea of creating this example project and using that project to demonstrate the, um, the power that PyTest um, provides. So when you check out the repository, and you can do that, it's on GitHub, it's just Hakebros um, Earth. Um, and as I mentioned, there are three different branches. So the master is kind of where we are starting with this blog post. The increased test coverage is kind of where we finish with this blog post. And the Europe hyphen branch is kind of where we will be finishing today after this talk. So when you first check out the project, um, you will see that there are already some tests. Um, kind of the idea is that um, this product person comes to us and says, Hello, hey, this Earth project is so super important uh, for delivering value to our users. Uh, unfortunately, the sole maintainer of this project left the company. Uh, we have no idea what it does. It's super important. Um, please have a look and see if there are any blind spots, something that we need to be worried about, and see if we need to do any uh, bug fixes. So when you first check out the project, you will see that there are a bunch of tests, but they all seem somewhat generic, at least in the naming. Uh, and when you run them, you will see that it's actually running on Python 2, or like it's using Python 2 syntax, even though it's specified on the readme that it's Python 3.7. So in this talk, I described and I'm sure you're all aware, since it's an advanced PyTest talk, that you can skip tests with PyTest. And I explain kind of that you can use those marker decorators. And then you run them again. And you will see that there is some test coverage. We are at 40, uh, sorry, 53%. And there is a lot of testing going on, which doesn't actually contribute to the code coverage, because it's really just uh, scaffolding, more or less. So I go on to explain that you can also skip modules. Then we run the tests again. And what you will see is that there's also an example file. And let me just uh, show that to you what it looks like. OK, so there is this example. And as you can see, it prints a whole bunch of stuff. Hello, adventurers. And then there are a bunch of folks who accept an invite, apparently. Then there are folks packing, and they're traveling. Um, I'm disappointed that Hinnick is not, he, he not, is, Hinnick is not here, uh, because, yeah, <laughs> you're always flying, so that's uh, surprising. Um, and there is something going on with PyCon US in North America. So fair enough. Going back to our tutorial. Um, so what I encourage folks attending this talk is kind of that it's important to have a different levels of testing. So there is, maybe you have heard of unit testing, you have maybe heard of integration testing. What I found most important as a test engineer is kind of that the, the code that users will be running is covered by tests, by meaningful tests. And sometimes this is referred to as happy path testing. So if you have an example on your readme, this example should work under all circumstances. Because if a user checks out your project, copy paste your example code into um, a local file, run that example, and it raises an, an exception, they will probably just go away and find an alternative. So I encourage people to write a test for this. So what we do here is we copy paste the script into a PyTest test. And we, just, we don't even have any assertions in here, because we just want to see if it raises an issue, sorry, an exception. And when we do, we see that it's actually passing. And when we go on to check if uh, the code coverage is any different now, we will see um, that there is coverage missing for those three functions. So what we do then is, 
since we are using PyTest, we can use fixtures to kind of run the same test, but over different kind of test scenarios. So we started with a small group of those adventurers, and then a large group, this is more comprehensive, and it includes the functions that, were, uh, that we saw were missed in the coverage report. So when we run this again, oh yeah, there was a, I included a bug here because, um, oh, maybe that's also worthwhile for you uh, knowing that since PyTest matches fixture functions with the names of positional arguments, um, we've had some issues on the PyTest project where people had tests silently passing or failing because they forgot to update the names to fixtures inside of the test bodies. Um, and since we're using Python and everything is an object, and if you're defining the fixture in the same module as your tests, Py Python will tell you, hey, there is an object, and if you're asserting that against, say, uh, none, or if it's a false value, your test might pass, because you're testing against the function definition rather than the fixture. Does that make sense? So what I, what I explain in this tutorial here is that there is a um, keyword argument that you can uh, can you, that you can pass to fixtures, and um, this will kind of prevent you from running into this issue. Um, a lot of test suites out there don't do this and uh, might be silently uh, having passing tests even though they're bugs. <laughs> um, so what we see then, if you're run the, running the tests again, is that something takes a lot long time. Um, so maybe just, uh, let me show you. So Poe is eating. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is based on a nature documentary. And as I learned that uh, pandas are very particular about their diet, they only eat bamboo. And since the nutritional value of bamboo is almost nothing, they're eating up to 14 hours a day. Um, so if you're inviting pandas to your conference, you should be aware that there might be delays. delays. Um, and there was also an issue here. Um, so it turns out that Dave didn't make it to our conference. Um, and we'll maybe find out why this is just in a second. So I'm explaining here that we can add markers, um, in arbitrary names for markers. You can document them in your PyTest config file. And we can use this later to write a plugin. So we're writing another test, but this time around, we don't have any pandas in our group so that our test is it kind of, we, we get the maximum percentage of coverage without compromising on the, on the speed of the test run. So we have three different scenarios now. Um, this is how you can run a more um, complex uh, expression on markers. So you can combine those different markers and PyTest is intelligent enough to kind of filter the, the tests out then. Um, there was this issue here that uh, Dave couldn't attend. Uh, the reason being that there is some randomness in the Earth project, and the way you can detect this with PyTest is installing the PyTest repeat plugin, running your tests a number of times, and then seeing if, if they're maybe passing if you run them more than once. You can mark them as X file. And then check the code coverage again, and we are at 98% uh, now, which is much better than the 53 that we had before. Which brings us to kind of the conclusion of this blog post, and that's kind of where we're starting today. So we have some test coverage. We already have um, a test based on PyTest. We have three different scenarios um, with a comprehensive group, which uh, the test is super slow. Then we have a fast one, which covers the example from the readme. And then we have kind of the middle ground a fast test which covers most of the functions that we have. Cool. Um, so if we have a look into the, um, the test now, test earth.
that's kind of where we are right now. So we have three different fixtures, as I mentioned, and then there are three different test implementations. And if you have experience with PyTest, this seems maybe a bit redundant. Um, so why have the test implementation copied multiple times? So what we do now is uh, we use something called um, PyTest mark parameterize um, to to kind of combine all of these tests into one. Give you a second maybe to read this. So it's the same test scenarios, the small group, the large group, the no pandas group. What you can also see here in this example is that we can apply PyTest markers to individual parameters of the parameterized um, decorator. So we have the same logic from before. And the indirect keyword, um, that's an important one, which is super useful. Um, what it does, it passes this string value here to the fixture called group. But rather than just overwriting the fixture value, we inject the string into the fixture. And we will have access to this using the request fixture on, uh, so PyTest built on request fixture. If we get the param, this will be the string. Uh, and in this example, we just match that against the actual fixture value. Uh, I will say, though, this is not the smartest solution because in here we uh, kind of depend on all of the fixtures. So if you have some, like some uh, slow maybe test setup, maybe you're connecting to the database or, I don't know, doing something here, you don't want to do this for every single test because you will run them for every test even though you might not need them fix the fixtures at all. Cool. Um, so what we did then in this uh, example here is we're starting our first um, PyTest plugin. Um, in the test, when we, when we kind of don't want to run all of the slow, slow tests as well, what we can do is we can write, implement a PyTest hook, which by default deselects all of the tests that are marked with slow. And this is how you would do it. Uh, we add an extra command line option using the PyTest add, opt add option hook implementation. And then we use the PyTest collection modify items hook, checking for the command line option. And if it's specified, we will apply the marker. Um, sorry, we are checking for a marker slow on the test item. And if we find it, we deselect the test. If not, we select it. So this means that by default, if we don't specify the dash dash slow um, command line option, we will skip all of the slow tests. Does everyone know what PyTest hooks are? Can you maybe raise your hands? That would be helpful. <laughs> okay, that's, that's fewer people than I uh, had anticipated. So the way PyTest works is, um, you can customize PyTest itself by developing plugins. And in PyTest's world, everything is kind of a plugin, meaning that even PyTest itself is built on top of a lot of internal plugins. So what these plugins do is they implement these hooks, they're uh, matched based on their names, and they are called in different steps of the test session. So um, for instance, the PyTest um, collection modifier items is called when PyTest collects all of the tests and then it calls these hooks into all of the different plugins and allows them to modify the, selected, the test selection. And you can implement those hooks yourself if you're writing a plugin. And this is kind of what we will be doing here in this talk. Um, what's also quite important is um, that there are a bunch of different plugins which already do a whole bunch of things. Um, and in this example, we were also looking at um, using external data um, for our tests. Um, there is a plugin called Variables, and this allows you to 
um, have some data maybe somewhere else. So here we have a JSON file. This could be maybe something that you download from, from an API um, to retrieve some information. And then um, we can get access to this from inside of PyTest with the PyTest variables plugin and then construct our um, test fixtures based on this information. So rather than testing only against the PyCon US event, we simply set up a fixture which iterates over all of these values and runs all of our tests against all of these different events. Um, so kind of the, the TLDR for this so far is um, you can do interesting things with PyTest. If you use fixtures, you parameterize them rather than copy pasting, this is what you would do with PyTest. So um, the first one that I want, the first plugin, sorry, let's, let's maybe go back to here. Yeah, so the first plugin that I wanted to show you today is a plugin that caches test durations. And what I mean by this is right now we explicitly mark a slow test as being slow. But it would be kind of nice if we can somehow defer this information from a previous test run. So if we run our test suite once and we measure how long a test takes, maybe we can kind of keep track of this information and use them for the next test run. And I kind of want to show you how you would do this when you're getting, getting, getting started. Um, and typically, sadly, this will require you to know a bit about PyTest itself. Um, so for the example of durations, what you would typically do is you might check the PyTest help and you will see that there is an option called dash dash durations, which gives you a list of your slowest tests. So with this in mind, what you can do is we can, we can search for this, um, this implementation in the PyTest project itself. And you will see that, the, um, so this is from the PyTest project itself. Um, and then you will find that the durations um, option um, will be setting the value um, to something which is called uh, durations. So if you then search for get option duration, awesome. Oh, it's durations. So as you can tell, there are many ways how you can retrieve options. Uh, it's a bit uh, messy, yeah. Uh, but anyways, so you, what you will find is that there is a hook implementation which uses the option. Um, and if you scroll down here, you will find that it's somehow iterating over something which is called reports. So if you run your tests, um, every test uh, item, so every single test will have a report created for it. And this will have inf extra information about your test. So then if you actually search for the reports here, um, you will see that uh, there's something reports here. So now that we know that every report has a duration, we can retrieve this from a hook that actually has access to all of the reports and use this information. But how do we actually keep track of, what we, of, of, of this information that from a previous test run? So there is another feature called dash dash LF in PyTest built in, which allows you to run the tests that failed in, during your last test run. So there seems to be some sort of capability inside of PyTest which allows you to keep track of this information. So if we search for LF again, we will find this cache provider plugin. And then if we look here, we will see that there is uh, an NF plugin, which is new tests. Um, but then there's also this LF plugin, so the last failure plugin. And in here, you will see that we actually have access to some sort of caching mechanism inside of PyTest. So then with this in mind, if you combine those two pieces together, we can use the durations on the reports and write them to PyTest's cache so that the next time we run the tests, we have access to this information and can select tests based on how long they took the last time. 
So going back to our Earth project, um, whoops. This is kind of what we end up with if we want to implement a plugin that uses this, those two capabilities together. So the caching mechanism and then the, the capability um, to, to deselect tests. And this is kind of the important piece here that in the collection modifier items hook implementation, when we iterate over the individual tests, we get access to the durations from the previous run using the cache here. And then if the duration for a test is longer than some value that we hard coded here in this example, then we will automatically add this turtle marker to this test item. So then if we run the tests, um, we can, uh, let's see, we can say pi tests, um, and we say we don't want to run tests that use the turtle marker. And you will see that they're quite fast. Um, let's include all of the tests. And you can see that they're, the tests are slow if we don't specify this. So just to reiterate, if we run the test with the dash dash slow, it will include all of the tests, but with this Turtle plugin, we can deselect those tests automatically based on the previous test run. And they're fast. And you can kind of check the, the data that's inside of the PyTest hash by using the cache show uh, here. So our kind of plugin here um, keeps track of the node ID, so that means the individual test item, and then stores the uh, the duration for the individual phases. So that's kind of the, the setup. So everything that happens before you get into the tests, which means like test, uh, sorry, code that's executed in the fixtures, for instance, then the actual test um, execution, and then the teardown. So this is one of the, f the kind of the, the um, features inside of PyTest, which will make your life much easier if you actually want to use the cache. So um, in the next step, let's kind of, um, we, we already saw that we had this um, variables fixture that we can use. Um, but what happens if we actually um, add a new item here? Imagine you have a large code base and you're changing this kind of external data and you update your tests, but your tests might be like it might be a large code base. Wouldn't it be cool if we had a plugin that allows you to only run the test that uses a specific fixture? So rather than running all of the tests all of the time, if we're just changing one fixture, why not just select those tests? Um, there is a command line flag which kind of gives you information about which tests um, uses which fixtures. And this prints out also like the doc strings and the individual um, location of the, the fixture definition. So that's super useful if you also use the same fixture name throughout your test suite multiple times. This is kind of a way to debug where your test gets its fixture from. So taking this to the next level, if we then look into a way maybe how we can run only the test that uses a specific fixture, um, we have this old plugin here. Um, and again, we only want to run this if we actually pass a command line option to it um, that we implemented uh, here in the add option hook. And what it allows us, it allows us to pass in the name of a fixture on the command line, and then based on that, it deselects tests. So using the same 
um, hook from before um, and pretty much the same, but instead of checking for the markers on the test items, what we do is we check if the name provided on the comment line is actually in the list of names of fixtures that are used by this test. Do you have any questions so far? Okay. So, so we have also the a hook implementation that allows you to create um, custom reports. So by default, you will see the command line output, uh, but if you're using a CI system like Jenkins or something, you might be required to uh, pass this information or like generate the report in a specific format. It uh, could be some XML. Um, and there is a hook which kind of allows you to collect all of the individual reports and then create a report, like a custom report for you based on that. So you could, in theory, write a plugin that uh, generates a report uh, in JSON and that re report will have the information, how many tests passed, failed, uh, errored, or something like this. Um, so if you kind of want to think maybe a bit out of, 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 of the box and maybe, maybe you want to write a plugin actually that if your tests pa sorry, fail for the very first time, you could even go as far as creating a GitHub issue for this and then add the test report generated from a different plugin and add it to the comment of the, of the issue, for instance. Um, so let's maybe just demonstrate that. So if we run the tests, and they are still fast, there is an error here. So sorry, let's maybe just add a test failure as well. So if we go to the, um, uh, let's just uh, travel for instance. So we just kind of want to create a, a failure for the, the purpose of demonstrating this. So if we run the test again, specify the elephant command line option that we implemented. Um, this, so we see that there was an error and there was a failure and we see here in the terminal summary. So for one, it generated this report in, in the markdown format for us, but it also created a GitHub issue for us. So if you open this, you can see that our custom plugin now created an issue against the Earth project, and it includes uh, our custom report that we just generated with the Markdown plugin. This might seem like a terrible idea, and it probably is, so you don't want to write, kind of perform any HTTP requests in your test run, but the reason that I'm showing this is kind of, it's super flexible. So you can, it's kind of brings us back to why we, we what, I, what, what I wanted to say in the very beginning. You can write all sorts of customizations which help your teams be more productive with when running the tests. And um, so this could be just one example um, what you could do, for instance. Um, there are other plugins which send notifications to Slack or your IRC channel or whatever when your tests uh, fail for the first time. Um, yeah. So this is kind of uh, where we'll finish with this. And then maybe the question is, so what do you do if you implement all of these plugins in your individual test suite? Wouldn't it be nice if you create also packages from that so that other people can also install your plugins and use them uh, rather than you just implement them locally in your own project? 
So this brings us kind of to the cookie cutter project, which makes uh, distributing code much more easy because it allows you to kind of scaffold an entire uh, Python package distribution and then uh, generate all of the necessary files and the code for you to, um, to implement PyTest plugins. So the cookie cutter project is a common line utility. This is kind of where you can find it. Um, it recently moved to a GitHub organization. So it used to be Audrey R slash cookie cutter. That's, that's new now. This is how you install it with pip. Um, and then there are template projects, mostly on GitHub. Um, and there is this PyTest, under uh, no, our PyTest uh, organization on GitHub, you will find this specific plugin. And this is probably the fastest way for you to write your own PyTest plugins because it generates the setup tools, entry points for you and all of that stuff. So you can focus on implementing your plugin rather than having to build the entire um, scaffolding outside of it. What Cookie Cutter then does, it will ask you a, a bunch of questions depending on what the template authors require you to provide. Um, so typically that's a name, a GitHub username or something, a name for the project. Um, and maybe it prompts you even for the, the kind of license that you want to use for your project. Um, sorry. And then it generates this uh, directory for you with all of the um, files here. As I mentioned, there are different uh, templates out there, um, and I want to focus you here on the PyTest dev plugin, which is, as I said, the best way for you to get started writing plugins. So maybe if we, if we uh, see how we can use that to use our own plugins and create distributions from that, um, we can create a plugins directory and then call cookie cutter into the plugins, PyTest plugin. That's a, a different kind of template that I use for my own personal um, plugins. Um, and that's just information. So in here, that's kind of the important piece, the plugin name, because that's kind of how your plugin will be referred to. Also, that's going to be the name that's uh, on PyPI for your plugin. Um, so if we, if we want to kind of publish our um, say the, uh, what's it called again, the turtle plugin, we can say plugin name turtle, um, a PyTest plugin that automatically marks slow tests. Uh, we select a license for it. And then if we check out this here, this generated a PyTest plugin for us. So, Rather than having all of our PyTest implementations in just our local test suite, we can now migrate that over uh, and, and publish our plugin code. So what you will do then, once you generate the, the kind of the code here, you will um, copy paste your stuff over and then delete it from your test suite and then add this plugin to your requirements. Cool, um, so I think that's, that's kind of the conclusion uh, of, of the talk so far. Uh, I hope this somehow helped you to learn more about uh, writing PyTest plugins. It's, it's mostly like the difficulty is knowing which hook is which called in which phase of the test run. And uh, what I wanted to demonstrate here is it it's typically comes down to reading the, the code of PyTest itself and then yeah, it's horrible, I know. <laughs> um, we started, in 2016, we started uh, changing the documentation of the entire project, which is a, a Herculean effort. Uh, so we, we never got to actually finishing it. Um, so my call to you, if you are interested in writing PyTest plugins, uh, you can please come talk to me and maybe you can uh, find more people who would be willing to help us um, changing the documentation that uh, facilitates kind of uh, PyTest uh, plugin um, development more. And then one thing that I just wanted to mention, we recently also um, started accepting uh, financial um, support for the PyTest project. So we're an open collective and Tidelift now. So if you use PyTest, maybe even for your job, I would encourage you to check out 
um, this um, page in our documentation um, and please talk to your managers. And uh, so this will allow us to not only print more stickers, but also send people um, from other regions to our development sprints. We did one in 2016 and we had people coming over from Australia and Brazil, uh, all to Germany. Um, and so if you use PyTest, uh, please support the project so we can keep on um, working on improving PyTest more. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some more time, and we can have at least three, three questions, at least, I guess. And any questions, user feedback, feature request? Any, anyone? Hi. Oh, oh, oh please. Uh, hi. Uh, can you name the best uh, plugin you write or the most helpful one? That the most uh, the feature that you find the most useful um, to write in plugins. So you're asking about plugins that I personally find super useful. Yeah. Okay. So typically, it's um, I I use different plugins for different scenarios. So for instance, when I'm uh, investigating intermittent failures, so tests that not fail every time but only sometimes, I will use the PyTest Repeat plugin. That's the one that I use to run the test multiple times all over again. If I'm checking for kind of the general uh, status maybe of my code coverage, there's the pytest-cuff uh, plugin, COV. Mm -hmm. um, and then I personally like the Markdown plugin, but I'm also the author, so I'm, I'm biased. And the reason being is because I sometimes just want to kind of copy my results from a test run into a GitHub issue or a gist on GitHub or something. And then I found it super tedious to copy paste the command line outputs and remove the directories from the output. So this is one of the other plugins that I find useful. OK, thank you yeah, very much. Sure. Yeah, I had a question on parameterized tests. Mm -hmm. It's quite often useful when you're running parameterized tests not to do all of the fixtures for setup. Is there any option for a scope so you can have scoped tests, so you don't have to run them for every single test, but only within a certain session, for example. Is there any chance of a, the feature or an alternative way of doing it to have the scope of a, a given parameterized set of tests? I think the parameterized decorator doesn't allow for this because it's evaluated at a different time than the fixtures, yeah. so it doesn't tie into the kind of the fixture scope mechanism. Um, a related question that always comes up is how you can combine those two, like fixtures and the parameterize. Um, there has been some work, uh, so we did some work on kind of seeing how we can combine them, and uh, the, the conclusion that was that, that was made was kind of that the internals of PyTest don't really allow for this at this point, but there's work going on um, that will hopefully allow us to do this, and I guess at this point we will also be able to specify the scope for the parameterize. Uh, Parameters. Okay, thank you. That'd be really helpful. Sure. Uh, hi, and thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding profiling. Do you recommend any plugin that integrates results for profiling and maybe trigger failures if complexity is too high or something like that? Um, I think Yonel wrote a plugin about this. Um, I would have to look this up. Um, I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but um, if you, so what's cool about um, the new uh, PyPI is that you can also search and there is a PyTest um, classifier. So if you search for the PyTest framework on PyPI, you will get a list of all of the different PyTest plugins. Okay. And probably if you provide a search term like profile, you will find something. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll do some research and maybe if you can talk later. Uh, so, so like a just Google PyTest classifiers uh, not, profile? Not Google, but on PyPI, the search. OK, OK. That's okay. probably your best chance. OK, thank you. Sure. Hi, uh, question. Uh, usually, when you need to improve your coverage, you need to deal also with the exceptions. Mm -hmm. So is there a plugin that triggers exceptions already in PyTest, or how do you could deal with that in PyTest? 
Um, I'm not sure I follow like the triggers exceptions. Yeah, so usually you want to test an exception also. Mm -hmm. So how would you do that in, in yeah, PyTest? Yeah, so you c um, there is a context manager for this in PyTest. Um, and uh, it looks like something like this uh, with PyTest raises, oh, sorry. Raises a value error, uh, and then you get access to the exception info object, and then you can, uh, I don't know, um, you can call some code that uh, triggers this, um, and then later you can get access to the, uh, I think it's message. So doing this, like you, you can use this uh, context manager to catch the exceptions and then specify that they're actually correct and contain the information that you care okay. about. Perfect. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, at the moment, you support unit tests, but are you planning for better support on subtests? On subtests? Yeah. For a unit test, uh, I think there is actually. I would have to check the change log, but I think there was some change going okay. in at some point uh, to better allow for subtests. At the moment, they are not displayed as separate or subtest okay. cases. Yeah, I remember the conversation on the mailing list, so I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah. Hi. Hey. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, what would be for you a good use case for the xfail decorator? Meaning, if you have a flaky test, I think the design philosophy that should be supportive would be to fix that flaky test rather than encourage it to pass. So I think you built it with some, you, you I mean the PyTest team built it with some philosophy in mind. Uh, so what's the use case that most would fit the usage of this feature? Yeah, I can't speak for the PyTest team because <laughs> I wasn't around when the XFail feature was integrated. I typically use it for intermittent failures. Um, for Sorry, for what? For intermittent failure, so like flaky tests yeah. and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's a very good question, but I don't think there is like a general answer to this. Uh, I certainly use the XFAIR for it. Um, and you know, like when the test passes, even though you marked it as XFAIR, it will show up as X pass. So you kind of expected the test to fail, but it passed. And there is a mode in PyTest which kind of creates errors from this. So if you want to use the X fail as something that you really want to fail, um, you can specify this extra option and this will generate okay. failures for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Hello. Hey. First of all, thanks for your work on PyTest. It's amazing. Even our data, data scientists in our team, they get it, they use it, they, they, they can, uh, even then. So, one question about the, that assertion there to you and all the audience. Where do you guys prefer to put the expected value on the left or on the right? Do you <laughs> use Yoda assertion or what's the best thing? Because the output is better, I think, for this case where you have your cursor to have the expected on the, on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, sometimes. Let's do a, a raise of hands, everyone left hand side for the expected value. <laughs> okay. Is that a, sorry? Was it a question or were you asked? <laughs> I just didn't get that. So. So when you're writing it, it, it makes sense to write it like you have done right where your cursor is, where the expected value is on the right. Yeah. But given that you know that foo is correct, when, you, when that goes wrong, it, it reads kind of the wrong way around, I, I think. So it, it says something like, I mean, maybe you need to run one and I can, can remi remind myself, but like, it basically ends up looking like foo was not the value that was expected, but foo what, what was what was expected, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Uh, let's see. Uh, So we can, this is kind of what you said, right? Yeah. yeah. Now it's going to do the right thing, and I'm going to get egg on my face, but that's what I thought. <laughs> um, 
let's get rid of this thing. So uh, this this uh, now raises this error because we created the plugin and it contains a local plugin and PyTest will uh, warn us about it. So uh, yep, that's good. So world is not hello. It, it's it's kind of as we specified here, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, you're right. But it's it's when you have like bigger cases and you have like a dictionary and it tries to tell you what's wrong with the dictionary. Right. That's where it gets confusing. Okay. Yeah, maybe that's good feedback. I'll, I'll maybe investigate and see if if there's maybe something that can improve in the display of the error messages. Often it would be really useful to, sorry, this isn't really relevant, but it'd be really useful just to print out what, what was given on the left, Yeah. rather than try and do the comparison that doesn't always work quite right. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. So I personally always put kind of, I, what I like about Python is because you can kind of read it as text. So when I'm reading an insertion, it's almost like, I'm, is what I have what I would expect? So that's kind of more than the English language sounds to me like. So I personally always put the, the kind of what I get on the left-hand side and what I would expect on the right-hand side. But that's just me. Uh, I have a question yeah. about, hello. Um, so I have this uh, big test suite, which uh, is often used by people that are not programmers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have uh, often comparisons between lists of complex objects. And uh, yeah, I'd like to know if there is a way of customizing the output so that they can be like uh, more easily understandable by people that actually know what the values mean, but they, you know, yeah. uh, without uh, customizing the whole output. Thank you. There is a, um, a plugin, oh sorry, uh, running on, uh, so I think there is a hook which allows you to kind of customize the representation that their cert generates. Um, I think that's what you're asking for, right? So if there is a way to improve this information. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Hi, so um, do you run your tests from the source directory or do you install them? I mean, especially when you're using an editor and try to do debugging and so on. I mean, the online advice I find is that you should always install the package and do the installed version. But then how does this work with your IDE or editor? Um, so I typically don't run them from inside of my editor itself. I just run them from the terminal. Um, and I typically don't uh, run PyTest directly, but I use Tox. Uh, and then I Tox will create a virtual environment and then run my tests against the installed version of my package, if that makes sense. So I, I, I think that's probably the safer way of testing it because you want to make sure that when people download your library, for instance, from PyPI, that it actually works for them rather than against the checkout of the project. Okay, any more questions? Okay, uh, if you have no more questions but you would like to uh, feedback to Raphael, you can download our conference app, Attentify, and give some rating. And that would be interesting. And let's uh, thank Raphael with a really big hand again. Thank you.